Hi, this is John Linnebal from John Linnebal Tutoring, and this is Elements to Know for the SAT Essay Part 2, Pathos. So if you watched Part 1 for Ethos, then you've seen this generalized SAT essay prompt. This is the same as the one you will see on the real SAT, except the author, instead of the actual author's name, they just put the author and the author, his slash her, etc. So the things that you need to look for are evidence, reasoning, and stylistic or persuasive elements. So evidence would be facts, examples, things that are facts. Reasoning would be logic to develop ideas, connect claims and evidence, and stylistic or persuasive elements such as word choice or appeals to emotion to add power to the ideas expressed. So what you're expected to do is write an essay in which you explain how the author builds an argument to persuade his or her audience of whatever the author's claim is. And in your essay, you want to analyze how the author uses one or more of the features listed in the box above. That's this here. And to strengthen the logic and persuasiveness of his or her argument, be sure that your analysis focuses on the most relevant features of the passage. So the things that really stick out should be the things you talk about. And the essay should not explain whether you agree with the author's claims, but rather how the author builds an argument to persuade his or her argument, or to persuade his or her audience whether or not you agree with the argument. All right, so there are three elements the SAT wants you to describe. I apologize to the people who've already watched the first video, but in case you're joining us at the, in this video, what you want to do is you want to describe three elements, ethos, pathos, and logos. So they don't use those names in the instructions, but you should know that evidence is ethos. Ethos is evidence, so that's evidence such as facts or examples. You get <clears throat> bonus points if you correctly identify that as ethos. Reasoning to develop ideas and connect claims and evidence. Now you might say, oh, okay, well if it's ethos, pathos, logos, this must be pathos. It's not. It's logos, logic is reasoning. And then pathos is stylistic or persuasive elements such as word choice or appeals to emotion to add power to the ideas expressed. All right, I don't know whether they purposely did that, but they probably did. So that way kids who just learned, oh, ethos, pathos, logos. Well, they have evidence, reasoning, and stylistic. So ethos must be the first one, pathos must be the second one, and logos must be the third one. Eh, no, it's not. So you have to take that in the right order and say, you know, ethos and then define it as evidence, pathos, define it as stylistic or, or persuasive, or you can just go logos and define it as reasoning and then, you know, basically have all of these things defined properly in most likely your thesis paragraph, the very first paragraph. You can say in the essay, ABC essay by XYZ author. The author, Mr. XYZ, uses ethos in the form of statistical evidence, pathos in the form of appeals to patriotism and the sense of duty, and logos in the form of connecting these things together using deductive logic um, to make his point that there should be a period of national service, whether it's in the military or non-military sector, before any student goes off to college, something like that. Okay, the second element is pathos. So pathos is defined as appeals to emotion, rhetoric, style, etc., as we already talked about. So one type of pathos is just sensory language. It's any language that appeals to the five senses, sight, sound, touch, smell, or taste. So normally these are going to be adjectives, crunchy, mmm, crunchy vegetables, and adverbs, um, you know, the... The stews smell wafted attractively and temptingly towards my nostrils, something like that. Okay, so you can use examples such as this one that I wrote. Do we really want skyscrapers, billboards, and condominium complexes to block our sky and bay views? Imagine being in the shadows at high noon because of those monolithic, cheaply built monstrosities. That's why we must limit new development in whatever city that might be. And maybe it's San Francisco or something like that. So, okay, here, monolithic, cheaply built. It's huge, it's ugly, it's a monstrosity, and it's, it's not even built well. Um, and it's blocking our sky and bay views. Well, you can feel like you're walking through this concrete canyon, and you're like, I used to be able to see the sky in San Francisco Bay. Now it's just all dark and ugly concrete. I don't like this at all. So, it's an appeal to the senses. Emotional appeal. 
It appeals to our sense of duty, love, patriotism, family, fear, greed, literally any kind of feeling or emotion that you could have to support a position. If you won't support our country when it needs you, why should it support you when you need it? That's why you must register with Selective Service if you want student aid. So that would be an appeal to your sense of patriotism and your sense of fairness. And, you know, well, why should any person or entity help you if you won't help that person or entity? And it's also a logical appeal to reciprocity. And we'll touch on that in the next video when we discuss logos or logic. The second element continued. Again, pathos or pathos is defined as it appeals to emotion, rhetoric, style, etc. So an attack. An attack is just pointing out factual or logical errors or other reasons why the views opposed by the author are unsound. So we can have something like this. Most people who claim they can't find a good job, in quotes, relationship, home, or anything else, don't understand that most jobs, relationships, homes, and anything worth having don't start out perfect they take work all right so yeah, you know maybe it's because you're lazy and you're just expecting to get something for nothing so that would certainly be an attack on that sort of person um humor well okay we have humor jokes irony sarcasm funny stories etc meant to entertain the reader and ideally make a point so the probability of toast with grape jelly on it falling jelly side down onto your white carpet is directly proportional to the cost of the carpet the likelihood of someone's hearing you talk nasty about them is directly proportional to the nastiness of the comment. So these are obviously not real statistics. They're just kind of illustrations of Murphy's Law that the more expensive your white carpet is, of course, the more likely you are to drop something on it that stains it. And it's just human nature. You know, As soon as you start talking really loudly and really nastily about one of your co-workers or one of your fellow students or whatever, that's going to be exactly when they're standing behind you and you don't know it. Okay, so we can see that's those are both at least mildly humorous. Formal language. So formal language is using language like your teachers and your parents, etc. use. It's attempts to establish the author's credibility through scholarly, academic, technical, or otherwise elevated or sophisticated language. Another way to think of it is what are textbooks written like? What are books you find in the library written like that aren't novels or aren't aimed at young kids? They're usually written in fairly sophisticated adult academic language. So they'll use academic, technical, or otherwise elevated or sophisticated language, such as Latin or French or other foreign phrases. In other words, it tries to make the author look smart and therefore believable. This can backfire if they use too much technical jargon, because then it just looks like you're, you're BSing. You're just kind of, eh, well, I'm just going to follow the maxim that if you can't dazzle them with your brilliance, baffle them with bullcrap. Okay. So an example might be, yes, the police can arrest people for loitering or littering, but de minimis non curat lex. The law does not concern itself with trifles. See, I just showed you I'm smart because I know a Latin phrase. And that's what it means is, well, okay, yeah, they could arrest someone for loitering or littering, but it's not worth their time. But here you said de minimis non curat lex, Ooh, formal language. Okay, informal language is everyday language, including slang, which is intended to make the writing approachable and easier for readers to relate to. Sorry, had a hard time figuring out how to not end that with a preposition, so I hope you'll forgive me. But anyway, literers need a bit of what my mama would do if I got caught making a mess without cleaning it up. A good old fashioned whooping. Maybe I should have made it clean in, you know, an apostrophe or something like that. Anyway, so it's going to be written in very informal, down-home, friendly language. Tabloids, like you buy in the supermarket, things like that, about celebrities and things like that, they're very, very good at writing in very, very friendly language. Jail isn't jail, it's the pokey. Someone's girlfriend is their gal pal. Um, things like that. Somebody who has a problem with drinking, oh, it's their battle with the bottle, you know makes things that really are not that nice sound a lot nicer than they are and certainly sounds very friendly. So another type of pathos is inclusive language. This is we language which is meant to have the audience identify with a point of view even if it's to admit to a fault. So for example preachers like to use that a lot or politicians if they want to get you behind an idea. 
we don't like it when people criticize our ideas. It feels as though we're being criticized. So you can own up to maybe a less than desirable character trait. Oh, yeah, he's right. I don't like being criticized, even if I know I'm wrong. Um, and it might also say, you know, we can do better. We can succeed as a nation. Da, da, da. We can work hard. You know, those are all good things that you would want to include people in and you want people to want to be included in. Exclusive language is language that's meant to distance the audience from a point of view, usually to criticize that point of view. So, it's a joke from George Carlin. Think of how stupid the average person is, and then remember half of them are dumber than that. That's probably the world's worst George Carlin impression, but you know what I mean. Anyway, definitely meant to separate you from those people. But I don't want to be separated from you. If you found this video useful, please like it and subscribe to this channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why do I care? Well, it's simple. YouTube won't let me share any ad revenue unless I have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of view time in a year. While many people are watching these, I don't have 4,000 hours of watch time within the last year, and I still don't really have 1,000 subscribers. Last I checked was about 815 or so. So, for the same reasons, you are not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I'm always happy to read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos, and I reserve the right to delete comments from and block those who specialize in destructive criticism. Trolls. Or people who post things that are off topic, spammers, disturb people. You always get a few who want to post some stupid website. Anyway, if you want to contact me, you can call me on my cell phone, 415-623-4251. You can text me on that same number. You can email me, john at johnlinneval.com. You can mail me, you know, just regular postal mail. I know how retro. 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. Thanks for watching. And if you have a copyright issue or any other kind of issue with this video, <clears throat> please contact me. I don't think I violated anyone's copyright, but... You know, always happy to hear, even if you have a complaint. And more contact information, contact me, Facebook, Instagram, email, and phone. On Facebook, you can reach me at www.facebook.com forward slash tutoring, all one word. Instagram, it's www.instagram.com, john.linabal.tutoring. Oops, I should have said forward after the Instagram.com, so forward slash john.linabal.tutoring in case you're not looking at this. Phone, my office phone is 415-986-7355 at my home office. And my email is john at johnlinnabal.com. And my website is www.johnlinnabal.com. You can also reach me at johnlinnabaltutoring.com. They're both going to forward to the same site. And then I do have a locals page at testpreparation.locals.com. And I will be getting some exclusive content on there eventually. But right now it's basically the same as what is on this YouTube channel. So, but if you'd like to support me, hey, go to locals.com, help me out, or donate through PayPal or things like that. Anyway, hope this helps. Hope you do a really good job on the SAT essay. Talk to you later. Bye.